What we've seen and heard from this president just in the past few hours really raises some serious questions about his fitness for office. And not for the first time, okay? I'm very aware of that. But this is stunning. You may have been at work today, but we're going to play some stuff for you. It's not, it's not just, you may not have seen it, it's not just the President of the United States contradicting the facts, though he is. It's not just that he's contradicting himself, though he is doing that too. It's that, it's that he's being knocked back on his heels by his own party, by his fellow Republicans who think that he's gone too far, leaving our allies, the Kurds, defenseless, and violating the Constitution by trying to steer business to his own resort. This president clearly knows that he is in trouble, as Republicans, some of them anyway, are beginning to call him out. So, as I said, tonight we're going we're gonna to fact check what the president says, as we always say around here, facts first. But if all that you've been hearing today are the short sound bites from the president, you really, really, you haven't heard the whole story. You gotta listen to, you've gotta listen longer to hear just how insecure this president sounds, how disconnected, how rambling, how worried. So here's what we're gonna do. Again, maybe you were at work, maybe you didn't see all of it, but that he, you know, was on today, spoke for a long time, just off the cuff. So we're gonna play some longer sound bites right now so that you can hear for yourself just how all of this sounded on live TV, okay? So listen to him talking about his call with the president of Ukraine that set off the whole impeachment inquiry. Here it is. This thing is all about a letter that was perfect. You never hear the letter anymore. It was all about whistleblowers. You never hear what happened to the whistleblower. They're gone because they've been discredited. What happened to the informant? And where is the IG? Why did the IG read the letter, read the transcript? He could have gotten it, I guess, I assume. I would have declassified it for him if I had to do that. Why didn't he read this and then see that the whistleblower's account was totally different than the letter? Then he would have said, oh, there's no problem here. The whistleblower gave a false account. Now you have to say, well, do we have to protect somebody that gave a false account? You know, these whistleblowers, they have them like they're angels, okay? So do we have to protect somebody that gave a totally false account of my conversation? I don't know. You tell me. Do we have to protect the informant? Now, I happen to think there probably wasn't an informant. You know, the informant went to the whistleblower. The whistleblower had second and third hand information. You remember that. That was a big problem. But the information was wrong. So was there actually an informant? Maybe the informant was Schiff. It could be Shifty Schiff. In my opinion, it's possibly Schiff. Um, that's not just unpresidential. You got to be honest with yourself. Come on. It's incoherent. So f follow along with me here. He claims a whistleblower's complaint was totally different from the rough transcript the White House released. The fact is, that complaint matched the transcript. It was not a false account. The whistleblower has not been discredited and far from it. That's what he says, but it's not the truth. It's not what the facts bear out. The, the whistleblower being discredited may be wishful thinking on the part of the president. And by the way, the complaint was not even about a letter, even though the president repeatedly calls it that. It was about that infamous phone call with the president of Ukraine. After asking why whistleblowers should be protected, answer, because it's the law, the president first says that he, he thinks there probably wasn't an informant, okay? Then just 15 seconds later, says he thinks the informant, remember he said he probably wasn't an informant, but then 15 seconds later says the informant was probably Congressman Adam Schiff, who the president may see as his number one enemy right now. So there probably wasn't an informant, but the informant, the one he just said probably doesn't exist, was possibly Adam Schiff. 
Is your head spinning yet? It should be because everybody else's was who watched it earlier. It should be spinning because it doesn't make any sense. It does not make any sense. And then there is this. Minutes after saying that he didn't want to leave troops in Syria, leaving the Kurds to fend for themselves after thousands and thousands of them died fighting ISIS, the president says that he is trying to get out of wars, but we might have to get into a war with Iran. In the midst of that, I'm trying to get out of wars. And we may have to get in wars, too. Okay? We may have to get in wars. We're better prepared than we've ever been. If Iran does something, they'll be hit like they've never been hit before. I mean, we have things that we're looking at. But can you imagine? I have to fight off these, these low lives. At the same time, I'm negotiating these very important things that should have been done during Obama and Bush and even before that. All right? So that's where we are right now. Actually, very few. Go ahead, please. Well, they're going to be sent initially to different parts, uh, get prepared, then ultimately we're bringing them home. Yeah. We're bringing our troops back home. I got elected on bringing our soldiers back home. Now, it's not very popular within the Beltway, because, you know, Lockheed doesn't like it, and these great military companies don't like it. It's not very popular. And outside the Beltway, my largest cheer in Dallas, I had 25,000 people close in that arena, a record crowd. I had so many people outside of the arena, thousands. My largest cheer that night was two things. We're building the wall, that's number one. And number two, and probably tied for number one, was we're bringing our soldiers back home. That was our largest cheer in Dallas, great place. Great state, Texas. Tough state, they, they're tough. When I said we're bringing our soldiers back home, the place went crazy. But within the Beltway, you know, people don't like it. It's much tougher for me, it'd be much easier for me to let our soldiers be there, let them continue to die. It's the president. Would you guys have given me the hook by now? Right, like right off the anchor desk, like, okay. They'd be speed flying Laura Coates here to come fill in. Anderson would be staying late or Chris or something. I mean, come on. Did you hear that? <laughs> he says he's trying to get out of wars and then immediately threatens war with Iran. Contradicting himself. That is a contradiction. One sentence to the next. I'm trying to get out of the war. Bring then we may have to get into a war. He goes directly from outrageously claiming that people in Washington don't want to bring troops home to bragging about the crowd at his rally in Dallas last week, to actually saying that it would be easier on him to let our troops continue to die. That's what he said. I'm not saying that. That's what he said. I just played it for you. The commander in chief. And then there's what he says about the diplomats giving depositions to Congress behind closed doors in the impeachment inquiry. They're interviewing ambassadors who I'd never heard of. I don't know who these people are. I never heard of them. And I have great <coughs> respect for some of them. One of them said just recently, uh, a very, very highly respected man, I'm not gonna get into their names, but a highly, said, no, no, we were very, very bothered by Joe Biden and his son. Back during the Obama administration. He said we were very, he's supposed to be their witness. Don't forget, many of these people were put there during Obama, during Clinton, <coughs> during the never Trump or Bush era. You know, you had a never Trump or Bush. You have heard of those. Those people might be worse than the <coughs> Democrats, the never Trumpers. The good news is they're dying off fast. They're on artificial respiration, I think. But no, impeachment, uh, they, they want to impeach and they want to do it as quick as possible. And that's pretty much the story. Okay. So I would play it for you again, but listen, we got a lot of show. But he says ambassadors that he's never heard of. He doesn't know who they are. But then the next sentence he says, but I have great respect for some of them. 
he doesn't know who they are. Never heard of them, but he's got great respect. Though not quite enough respect to be able to name any of them. Yet he can repeat what they have said if what they have said fits with the story that he wants you to hear. Are you listening to me, people? Are you, are you listening to the sound bites here? Then he goes directly to blasting people he sees as his enemies, including in his own party, doubling back to what he's, what he's really worried about. Impeachment. Like I said, he knows he is on thin ice. He knows he's on thin ice with his own party over Syria and over his blatant attempt to use the G7 to drum up business for his Doral resort. 